This is actually recorded, um, not on a Sunday morning, but I missed being able to record it. So, dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace. Amen. Today is the first Sunday in Lent. As you notice, the pyramids are purple. It's 40 days before Easter. Uh, that's what the season of Lent is. Actually, the 40 days do not include the Sundays. Those are always a celebration of the resurrection, but the uh, Sundays are um, outside of that. The 40 days are a time of preparation that lead us into Holy Week with um, our Wednesday services, and then the most Holy Week with Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then the celebration of Easter. And during these Sundays, we're going to spend five weeks going through really the most familiar psalm in the Bible, probably the most familiar portion of Scripture, the 23rd Psalm. We're going to take it kind of section by section during these five weeks and spend some time with this familiar, comforting, well-known psalm. And sometimes, the reason I'm doing that is that sometimes the familiarity of the words of the psalm can sometimes hinder the reader from entering into a thought pattern about the real meaning and intent of the words. I mean, sometimes the Lord is my shepherd. It starts, and our minds kind of go into, we know what the rest of it is. Sometimes we even say it by memory. We're going to be looking at different paraphrases as we go through section by section this psalm. One of them is from Eugene Peterson, a well-known author for his paraphrases of the Bible. And one of his paraphrases of Psalm 23 goes like this. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You've bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me cool, quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid, but when you walk by my side, your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty um, and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back at ho home in the house of the Lord for the rest of my life. This morning we're focusing on the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or God, my shepherd, I don't want a thing. Both of those versions uh, of the paraphrases are really correct. Um, the words of Psalm 23 are the words of King David, an answer, ancestor in our faith who was delivered in many ways from the dangers of life and sometimes his incredibly stupid mistakes. And he praised God for God's presence with him during that time of danger. The psalm singer, King David, takes on the role of a, shep of a sheep or a goat, an animal that's herded by shepherds. Those are animals that, without the care of a shepherd, would be easy prey for other animals to uh, devour in the open grazing land. And so in the psalm, the shepherd provides green grass for grazing, still waters for drinking, the right paths for travel from one grazing place to another in verses 2 and 3. In troubled areas, the protection of the shepherd always provides for safe passage for the flock in verse 4. When trouble is nearby, the shepherd makes sure that the flock can feed and water in safety and can lie down for a night's rest in verse 5. Therefore, the sheep and the flock can be counted, can count on the shepherd for continued existence because of the faithfulness of the shepherd in verse 6. Now, descriptions of God as those found in Psalm 23 abound in the psalm. God is a shepherd. God cares for, protects those who need it like a shepherd protects his flock so also will god protect us the message of psalm 23 is clear so the first part the lord is my shepherd i shall not want um, ever since my planning on this of the lord is my shepherd i shall not want the sheep have food protection everything they need rest green pastures still waters they have all they want and 
as I've been preparing on this, I've, I've, I've started to realize, because of this song, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, that there's nothing that I want. I mean, I've, I've been living with this song for the last couple of weeks in preparation, and, and in my heart I realize there's nothing I want. The Lord is my shepherd, there's nothing I want. And so there's nothing I want. You know, for the most part, I mean, there, there's a couple of reasonable things I want. Um, I mean, let's start with a new car. My PT Cruiser has 153,000 miles on it. It's 10 years old. It's running into some trouble here and there. I want a new car. And, you know, I have a flat screen TV at home, but I really want a Blu-ray DVD player. And, and I want some cool apps for my iPad and iPhone. I want one of those driving ones where you can go back and forth and up. And, I mean, I want one of those. I mean, those are reasonable wants. I mean... Well, I'm at, <coughs> I'm at it. There's a couple more things I want besides those material things. I want a happy life. I want to live in safety and security. I want someone to show me that they care about me. I want what's best for my children. I want worship to be engaging and fun. I want God to love me. I want our children to live in a country that has access to education and freedom from fear of guns in school. I want health for those who are sick. I want it to be affordable. I, I, want, I, mean, I like a couple things I want, but I feel like Mick Jagger and I can get no satisfaction. You know, those are only my wants. What do we do with the wanting in the world around us and all of the consequences of being unfulfilled, unrealized, and un, unattainable? I mean, we're in a culture that thrives on teaching us to want and wanting more and more. The cost of I want is great, not only to our culture in America, but also to the, to the different places around the world where our Western materialism and consumerism has spread. I want has become a global epidemic, and it's literally impossible to satisfy all those needs and wants. But the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. For all of this wanting in the world around us and in our own private worlds, how do we deal with the consequences of our wants? How do we read these well-loved words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want? You know, Psalm 23 is so familiar, so well-known, so ingrained in us that perhaps the familiarity of the words and maybe even our sentimentality about Psalm 23 makes it difficult to realize how challenging it really is. Kind of like Jesus' Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, you know, they kind of roll over us, and as they roll over us, their edges are rolled off, just like words that make us feel good when we're feeling down. You know, as much as we would like our faith to be straightforward and, and, and realistic. For most of us, faith comes with at least a little bit of doubt and confusion and struggle. Most of us try to keep up a good appearance of faith. I mean, most of us avoid expressing our desires or wants or fears, especially when Psalm 23 seems to tell us that we shouldn't want any longer. And so perhaps it would be helpful if a different direction were followed as we consider what it means that the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Because, because as Christians, we read Psalm 23 through the lens of the New Testament, through the lens of John chapter 10, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. My own know me and I know them. I and the Father are one, and to know me means to know God, Jesus says. As Christians, we read Psalm 23 through the lens of the New Testament of the Trinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, where we know God through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we know Jesus is the Good Shepherd, the Lord and Savior who watches over us as sheep to protect us and to make sure that we don't 
want for more. Jesus, <clears throat> as a good shepherd, is the one who lays down his life for his sheep. Remember that because that's a New Testament witness. One of the Old Testament lessons that we'll read during Lent is from Isaiah, who writes in chapter 53, He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open up his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Those words are confirmed in Philippians, where Paul writes, Christ Jesus Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in human likeness and being found in human likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And that's where it becomes amazing and astounding and awesome. The Lord who is my shepherd is the one who is Jesus and who comes to us in all of our fears, all of our anxieties, all of our senses and feelings of alienation and aloneness, even in those moments of God forsakenness where we think that God has left us in our pain. And Jesus says to us, you know, there's nothing that you face that I haven't faced before. He says, there's nowhere you're going to go where I haven't experienced that before. There's nothing that you will do that will create a distance between you and me. Jesus is both the good shepherd and the sheep that was led to the slaughter, the lamb that was led to the slaughter, and the lamb that who was slain that has begun his reign. And that means, that means, that in Jesus the Good Shepherd, we will not be left wanting for a God that does not understand us. We will not be left wanting for a God who stands at arm's length up in heaven, untouched by what it means to be created human. We will not want a God who sits removed far away, untouched by our struggles, our failures, and our wantings. In life and in death, Jesus became one of us, became one of us in every day so that one day we might become like him. Being drawn into the struggles and challenges of the death of Jesus means that we are given share in a new life of resurrection like his. No longer are we sheep that are left alone to our own devices. Rather, we are sheep that have been led home to be with the Good Shepherd. And that's why that's why this Psalm 23 is so comforting to be read at difficult situations, at bedsides at the hospital, at funerals and memorial services. Following a tragedy or when people are asking, why did God let this happen? At those times, the Psalm 23 is often read as a reminder that God's promise was never that life was going to be easy or fair. God does not promise you an easy or fair life, but God's promise is that when it's your turn to experience the unfairness of life, no matter how hard it is, you will be able to get through it because you have a God who is by your side, a God who will give you the strength to find your way through because God is good. God is good all the time and all the time God is good. And nature and life tell us that life and nature is not always so good. Nature and life are sometimes blind. Fire burns and bullets wound and kill. Accidents happen, cancer grows, disease and germs infect people whether they deserve it or not. And the role of Jesus the Good Shepherd is not to explain, not to justify, but rather to comfort. The role of Jesus the Good Shepherd is to find people who are living in the darkness and take them and lead them and guide them by the hand and to show them how to find their way into sunlight again. That's the role. That's the role of Jesus the Good Shepherd, to lead, to guide, to comfort, and to bring us to a place where nothing in all of creation, nothing anywhere, anytime, will be able to separate us from the love and care of a good shepherd who guides us and leads us to comfort, 
and safety by his side in his home forevermore. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Who could want for anything more? In Jesus' name, amen.